for stopping by Sheila's audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain per United States copyright law. This story is about the Shandon family, particularly the twins Neville and Roger. The likeness between the twins went even deeper than the surface. Both owed their success in life to a certain hardness of character coupled with an abundance of energy. Neville, going to the bar, had made himself feared from the first as a brutal and domineering cross-examiner, and his criminal practice had done little to soften his professional manners. Roger's rise to prosperity had been more mysterious. It was vaguely known that he had made money in South Africa and South America, but the exact methods which had led to his fortune were never discussed by him. He had come home at the age of 45 to find his brother one of the leading lights of the bar. The purchase of the little Whistlefield estate had followed, and Roger had apparently been content to settle down in the countryside and make a clean break with the interests of his past. I'd rather choose that solution than any of the other possible ones. If you reject it, you've got to assume that two independent murderers, both using the same out-of-the-way method, chose to operate simultaneously. The chances against that are miles too big. Or else you have to believe that two cooperating murderers were at work and that each of them thought he had the right victim in front of him. I can't quite swallow the notion that this was a cooperative affair. The third solution is that the murderer mistook one brother for the other, killed Roger first, and then had to kill Neville to carry out his instructions. He might have had only a general description of Neville Shandon to go on and may have made a mistake in identity. I doubt if Hackleton would have left any loophole of that sort, Sir Clinton interrupted. Neville's portrait could easily have been bought and given to the murderer. But it's not worth while arguing the point. The murderer knew the two Shandons perfectly well by sight. I'm sure of my ground there. You mean the murderer was a local man? Demanded Wendover. How did you find that out? I'm not going to tell you at present, squire. Sorry to play the mystery man, and all that sort of stuff, but it has to be done. Wendover was plainly distrustful of this point. If it was a local affair, what was the black silk thread then? The thread we found in the maze not a couple of hours ago. Sir Clinton closed his eyes as though pondering deeply. Yes indeed, he said oracularly, what was the silk thread? He sat up suddenly and beamed on Wendover. I should say it was a clue. Damn your leg pulling, the squire broke out. I shan't go on, if you're going to make the whole thing into a farce. Sir Clinton apologized. Sorry. You took the wrong meaning out of what I said. But don't let's waste time over it. Please go ahead, squire. Only partly mollified, Wendover continued his analysis. The next thing is the burglary. That was obviously a case of getting at some document belonging to Neville Shandon. You remember the fragment of notes for his cross-examination that was found in his hand? They got some of his stuff, but clearly they suspected that he might have more notes. So they burgled his room to see if they could find anything further. This time Sir Clinton showed no desire to criticize. Right. On the face of it, the burglary and the murder of Neville Shandon fit together. But the trouble is that the commission of the burglary would show that it was Neville they were after, and hence make the murder of Roger useless as a blind. I merely point out the snag. I'm not trying to carp, squire. Wendover thought for a minute or more in silence, then he produced a reply. The two murders were part of a pre-devised scheme, as I suggested. But afterwards, the murderer found he hadn't got the documents complete. He had to get them, if possible so he took the risk of the burglary giving the show away. Sir Clinton admitted the possibility of such a case. But now what about the attack on Ernest Shandon? How does that fit in? What's one murder more or less to a man who has two on his soul already? The attack on Ernest may have been an extra blind, simply, like the murder of Roger Shandon. Suppose they'd got Ernest this afternoon, wouldn't that have tangled the business up still further? Admitted, of course. And really friend Ernest would hardly have been missed. Is that all the theory you have on the point? Wendover was rather doubtful about putting forward his second choice. It might have been a practical joke, of course. 
Someone with a sense of humor rather out of gear might have had a grudge against the little beast and, knowing he was an arrant coward, they might have stirred him up without meaning to do him any real harm, just used an ordinary air gun dart. He looked at Sir Clinton suspiciously. You yourself didn't waste much worry over him, it seemed to me. I thought at the time that you were taking it as a practical joke, somehow. A very practical joke, Sir Clinton said, but he kept every tinge of expression out of his voice when he made the comment. Now we can go on to the identity of Hackleton's agent, Wendover resumed. You say it was someone who knew the Shandons by sight. It must have been someone who had leave to come and go at will through the Whistlefield grounds, or else someone who landed on the riverbank. That limits things down a good deal. Roger Shandon didn't encourage strangers to roam about his place. The gardeners had orders to turn out anyone who ventured in, unless they were going up to the house on business. No stranger or neighbor, Bar Kostok, was on the premises so far as is known. I came across one of the gardeners and he told me that. Sir Clinton had no hesitation in confirming this. That agrees with all my men have been able to make out. Then, Wendover proceeded, we're limited down to the people at the house, the staff of the place, and Kostok. Go on, Sir Clinton encouraged him. Wendover pulled a notebook from his pocket and consulted some figures which he had jotted down at the time he heard the original evidence. If you take the facts as we know them, he went on, it's clear that Neville Shandon could not have reached the maze before 3.37 p.m., and the second murder was over before 4.5 p.m. As a matter of fact, the times really allow less margin than that, for Neville's body was found at 3.52 p.m. and both were probably dead by that time. I think that's quite demonstrable on Torrance's evidence, Sir Clinton admitted. That means then that the murderer left the maze at some time not much earlier than four o'clock, since Miss Forrest heard him in the maze after Neville's body was found by Torrance at 3.52 p.m. Most probable on the face of it. Then if you find someone in such a position that they could not have been in the maze at 4 p.m., they're cleared. True. Wendover produced from a cupboard an ordnance survey map of the district. Let's take each person in turn and see if we can establish their positions during the afternoon. I can help you there. Sir Clinton volunteered. I got most of it in the police reports. They were busy on that very point. Wendover nodded and began without more ado. Sylvia Hawkehurst. She was out paying a call, wasn't she? Yes, Sir Clinton explained. She and friend Ernest went off in the car from the house at about eighteen minutes past three. At a quarter to four, just about the moment when the murders occurred, she was in a shop buying shoelaces. That precludes any chance of her having used the car to get back to the maze at the critical time. After that she paid a call on some friends and stayed with them until she came back home after six o'clock. What about Ernest Shandon? Sir Clinton smiled. Miss Hawkehurst dropped him at the east gate as she passed out. It's about two and a half miles to the east gate, and she says she was driving about fifteen miles an hour, it's a narrow road, you remember. That means she dropped him at the east gate at about 3.30. It's the best part of two miles back to the maze. Friend Ernest could hardly have walked it in fifteen minutes, could he? And he's not much of a runner, to judge by his condition this morning. As a matter of fact, his story's completely confirmed by other evidence. My men interviewed the driver of the postcart, at 4.20 he came upon Ernest squatting by the roadside, about a mile along the public road, into which the east gate leads. It's a place where there's a little wood, easily identifiable. Friend Ernest was sitting there with his boot off, damning the nail that had hurt him. Wendover looked at his map. That clears him. I can see the wood, it's the only one that abuts on the road in that stretch. Now what about Arthur? We've only his own word for his movements. He certainly set out for the spinney, but that's all one can say. Wendover scanned his map once more. The spinney's only a mile from the maze in a direct line. He might have cut across and got away again, and no one would be any wiser. He had all the afternoon for the affair. His face clouded. Somehow, 
I don't think he was responsible, Clinton. Sir Clinton made no direct reply. He was hardly a likely agent for Hackleton to fix on, at any rate, he observed. Well, let's get on. What about the gardeners? Two of them were working in a field about a mile from the maze all afternoon. Each clears the other. And the third gardener who was on the spot that day, the man Skeen? His story is that he was working in the kitchen garden near the house. There's no evidence against that. The maids? And the chauffeur? All accounted for. They had nothing to do with the affair. And Stenness? Wendover looked keenly at Sir Clinton as he brought out the secretary's name, but the chief constable showed no sign of special interest. Stenness? He repeated. Stenness was undoubtedly at the house at twenty to five, or thereabouts, for Miss Forrest saw him when she came back. Then he'd plenty of time to be down at the maze at the critical period and get home to the house again while Torrance and Miss Forrest were wandering about in the labyrinth? He had, Sir Clinton agreed, gravely. He'd have been the ideal agent for Hackleton, Wendover pursued. And if Ernest's not got the wind up about nothing, which is always possible, of course, Stenness would be worth watching. He is being watched, Sir Clinton assured him, and then seemed to regret his confidence. Wendover, however, seized on the point at once. Ah! So after all your criticisms it seems you believe in my original theory. I've forgotten which that was, by this time, Sir Clinton admitted. What was it? The squire was rather nettled. You poured scorn on it at the time. What I said was this, suppose Hackleton hired a man to put Neville Shandon out of the way. You say that was a local man, according to some evidence which you haven't divulged to me. Very good. If he was a local man, he might have had access to Roger Shandon's private papers, his checkbook, and so forth. When he was hired for the Neville Shandon business, he may have decided to make a bit extra by forgery, and cover it up by the second murder. Two murders are as cheap as one, when it comes to pay for them, and Roger's murder has confused the trail very considerably. It's only a question of identifying the man who could have managed all that without going too much out of his way and attracting attention. Sir Clinton had been listening carefully to Wendover's exposition. That's very neat indeed, he conceded, it would certainly hold water, if it fitted all the facts that you know, squire, but unfortunately it leaves out of account the most interesting fact of all. And that is? Wendover demanded, with some asperity. He was annoyed to find that he had overlooked something. That is the most interesting fact of all, Sir Clinton assured him blandly. Then, with a change of tone, and that's all I'm able to say just now, squire. I've no fault to find with your reasoning. It hangs together beautifully. But sometimes the human mind, if you follow me, is apt to assume connections where no such things exist in nature. We've got an instinctive craving to trace associations between sets of phenomena, and at times we kid ourselves that there is some relationship when really it's only a case of simultaneity. You've been reading one of these shilling manuals lately, said Wendover suspiciously. How to be a philosopher in ten minutes, or something like that. All this gay talk about simultaneity and phenomena and association comes straight from there. You can't deceive me with a veneer of learning. Well, I won't dazzle you with further extracts. Let's get back to business. Go on with your list. Young Torrance, Wendover continued. He's a possible agent. I don't know about his financial circumstances, he may be hard up, for all I know, and amenable to the cash bait that Hackleton could offer. It would be a pretty big one. Young Torrance was the person who proposed that game in the maze to Miss Forrest. That would give him a reasonable excuse for being in the maze at that particular time, and further, it would ensure that he was free from the girl's supervision at the critical moment. Could you have invented a neater dodge yourself if you'd been set to it? No, Sir Clinton admitted, frankly, I doubt if I could. Take another point, Wendover pursued his line of reasoning with increased interest. What evidence have we that there ever was a third individual in the maze at all? Torrance's statements, but if Torrance was the murderer himself, of course he'd insist that a third person was present. 
Miss Forrest's story of someone running in the maze, but that may have been Torrance himself. You remember that she found it most difficult to tell the direction from which sounds came when she was in the maze. That's a theory that might take some upsetting, Squire, if you can explain just one point. What did Torrance do with his air gun after he'd finished with it? No air gun was found in the maze after the business. The murderer got rid of it somehow. I see no great difficulty there, Wendover pointed out at once. Look at the time Miss Forrest spent in wandering up and down in the maze, unable to find her way out. If Torrance knew the labyrinth, he could easily make his way through it, get out to the river bank, chuck his gun into the water, and sprint back again into the maze before she noticed his absence. He thought for a moment before adding. In fact, I don't see why he mayn't have got rid of the gun in the interval between the last murder and the moment he gave the alarm, the time when he shouted out that he'd found the body. He paused again. Then a further flash of insight threw a fresh light on the case. Why, of course, that would account for the running man. He would be rushing to the river bank and back again as quick as he could go, for the essential thing would be to get rid of the gun before anyone met him in the maze. Sir Clinton had dropped all his air of superior criticism. That's remarkably neat, squire. I shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't touch the root of the business, at one or two points, at the least. Curiously enough, the chief constable's comment produced a complete change in Wendover's mental outlook. He had fallen upon the Whistlefield case with all the enthusiasm of the irresponsible amateur. The mystery of it had caught his imagination, and he had thrown himself into the chase for a solution with an eagerness which he had hardly realized himself. He felt no more responsibility than if he had been attempting to follow clues in a detective story. Even the characters involved in the affair failed to give him any particular emotional background. He had never been intimate with the Shandon group, and some of the party he had not so much as seen before the tragedy occurred. Consequently, though he had used the real names of the various people concerned in the affair, they had borne no more significance than if he had said Mr. X or Mr. Y. The atmosphere in which he had worked had been that of a chess problem rather than an affair in real life. And now, at Sir Clinton's change of attitude, he caught a glimpse of a fresh side. It seemed that the line of thought which he had suggested might lead to something definite. It was no longer a case of idle speculation about the criminality of Mr. X or the guilt of Mr. Y instead, it was a question whether that rather decent young fellow Howard Torrance was going to find his neck in a noose one of these fine mornings. His own speculations might be the starting point for a fresh line of detection. It came upon him with something of oppression that in his position with regard to Sir Clinton, his speculations might be put to practical use. Situated as he was, it was hardly so irresponsible a position as he had supposed, but at this point in his train of thought a fresh idea occurred to him. Clinton said he knew who the murderer is. So my speculations don't matter much. But it would have been a bad business if I'd turned suspicion on young Torrance. He might have had a lot of difficulty in clearing himself, if Clinton had taken up that line. Sir Clinton broke in at this moment. You don't suspect Miss Forrest, I suppose? No. All the amusement had gone out of the game, so far as Wendover was concerned, but Sir Clinton seemed to have no inkling of this, and pursued his way through the list. Then that leaves Costock, he pointed out. I don't think Costock did it, Wendover declared. He felt inclined to turn his criticism into the other camp now. What have you against Costock? Can you bring any evidence to show that he had Korari in hand? Or that he had an air gun? Or even that he was in the maze at all at the time of the murders? If that's your line, said Sir Clinton, with a noncommittal gesture, we'll say no more about it. I'll look after Costock. Now there's one name left, Ardsley. You'd better leave Ardsley to me, squire. You're far too apt to see red on that subject. You couldn't produce an unbiased view of him if you tried. Have you any evidence about his movements that afternoon? Wendover asked, perfunctorily. Sir Clinton also seemed to have grown tired of the business. You'll find Ardsley's name pretty prominent in the Whistlefield business when it's all cleared up, I think. But I'm not prepared at present to say exactly what his part in the affair may turn out to be in the end. 
Wendover was only too glad to let the matter rest at this point. Irresponsible speculation is one thing, speculation which may lead up to a death sentence is something quite different. Suppose his ingenious reasoning, he had to admit that some of it was ingenious, were to lead to a wrongful conviction. He hadn't quite seen it in that light before. It was all very well for Clinton to go in for theorizing. It was his job to find the criminal and convict him. But Wendover had begun to feel that it was hardly for an amateur to step in and take a hand. Why, already he had light-heartedly thrown out suspicions against several people, and obviously some, at least, of these suspicions must be baseless. He would keep out of the field in future, he resolved. But there was still one point in connection with the Whistlefield case which had given him a good deal of perplexity. It threw no suspicion on anyone. He decided to clear it up if possible. There's one thing I've been thinking over, he began. Why did you pretend you'd forgotten those darts on the museum mantelpiece, when all the time you'd left them there deliberately? You acted the part pretty well, Clinton. You took me in completely at the first rush. I thought it was real vexation over a genuine mistake. But when I'd had time to think about it, I saw plainly enough that you'd done it on purpose. You're not the sort that makes silly mistakes of that kind. Sir Clinton came out of his reserve at once. I'm not fooling now, squire, he said gravely. I'm absolutely serious. I've staked my main case on that affair. I'm not able to tell you how or why at present. But you mustn't breathe a word about it to a living soul, no matter what happens next. Wendover, in that moment, had a glimpse of a rarely displayed side of Sir Clinton's character. It convinced him, without further argument. Very good. Nobody will learn it from me. You may find it pretty difficult to hold your tongue, squire, but I trust you to do it. The temptation will probably be very strong before long. I'm hoping for the best, but I warn you that I'm expecting some pretty black work at Whistlefield before we're through with this business. I couldn't help seeing the funny side of Ernest Shandon's affair, but the next one may not have much fun about it. You can take my word for it that tragedy's in the wings, now, waiting for its cue. So, no matter what happens, keep a tight grip on your tongue. You're the only one who could spot that I was acting then. Nobody at Whistlefield knows anything about me. They took me for a blundering idiot. And that's precisely what I wanted. Chapter 12 The Fourth Attack I see the coroner's jury brought in a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown, Wendover remarked. I suppose it's the only verdict that would fit the case. They seem to think you'd been rather slack in not having it all cut and dried for them, Clinton. Quite obviously they wanted the murderer's head on a charger, and they were disappointed when you couldn't produce the article. I think they were disappointed that we hadn't given them more evidence than we did, Sir Clinton suggested with a certain indifference in his tone. They seemed to imagine that the whole affair had been got up for their amusement, so that half of them could take on the post of Sherlock on the pounce they can pounce away to their hearts content if they wish. I'm not stopping them. But it isn't my business to supply them with spring boards, though they seem to think so. All I wanted was to get the formalities through without too much jaw. And the coroner, decent man, saw to that for me. What about your own swoops and pounces, before you wax ironical about these unfortunate yokels? It doesn't seem to me that you've got very much farther than they've done, after all. What about it, Clinton? Sir Clinton laughed teasingly. The Hackleton case is dragging along still, he said, with the obvious intention of changing the subject. Shandon's junior isn't making much out of it, so far as I can see. Old man Hackleton has every reason to be content with the removal of Neville Shandon. He's having it all his own way in the case now, far too clever for the poor barrister. He'll get off scot-free, or I'm much mistaken. Wendover refused to be led away on this fresh trail. Seriously, he said, you don't seem to be doing much on this Whistlefield case. You've just been loafing about these last few days. Sir Clinton did not defend himself. In fact, he went out of his way to underline Wendover's complaint, and tonight I'm actually dragging you off to play bridge at Whistlefield, eh? Well, the invitation didn't originate with me. It came from Miss Hawkehurst. 
I admit that I angled for it in a somewhat unprincipled way, gave her to understand that the company of a sour old bachelor was getting on my nerves here, that I'd welcome a little bright feminine society, and that the society of herself and Miss Forrest had just the very kind of brightness that the case needed. She must have felt flattered. Wendover commented ironically. Oh, of course it was put in my most delicate vein. Then Sir Clinton became suddenly serious. I'm not very happy in mind about things, squire, and I want to get a footing in that house apart from purely professional visits. Hence the angling. Otherwise, the thing would be in the worst of taste, I quite admit. Wendover pricked up his ears. Are you expecting more trouble even now? Nothing's happened. Since the last time? No, it's rather a curious point which you may have noticed, squire. Nothing ever does happen between the last time and the next time. That I should say was an almost invariable rule in life. You evidently lost the chance of a good job when the Sibyls went out of business, said Wendover in a disappointed tone. You could have written up their books for them in the very best style. You're a past master in the art of seeming to say something important and really saying nothing whatever. It often comes in useful, said Sir Clinton. But why say anything at all? It seems just about the time when we ought to be starting for Whistlefield. Suppose we take the hint. He refused to discuss the Whistlefield case during the drive across, or even to give Wendover an inkling of why he wished to get a footing in the house at all. The squire was not quite satisfied. To him, it appeared rather like a breach of hospitality for them to go there with anything in their minds beyond the game for which they had been invited. He disliked the idea of Sir Clinton Driffield introducing his alter ego the chief constable into a neighbor's house by this indirect method. When they arrived they found only four of the Whistlefield party awaiting them. Arthur Hawkehurst was busy with the loud speaker, from which he was evoking weird oscillation notes in the course of his endeavors to pick up different stations. Ernest Shandon was sitting drowsily in a corner of the room, and Wendover noticed with distaste that he had a spirit decanter and siphon on a table beside him. As the chief constable and Wendover were announced, Sylvia came forward. So glad you've come, Sir Clinton. We're looking forward to some decent bridge. A weird howl from the loudspeaker drowned the remainder of her words. Ernest lifted himself from his chair with an effort and approached them. Are you much of a bridge player? He inquired apathetically. I never cared enough for the game to do much good. It's such a lot of trouble, you know. All this business of struggling for the declaration, and all that. And if one gets keen on it one's apt to get very keen, and perhaps then one spends a lot of time over it. And one might spend that time in other ways, perhaps better, don't you think? But perhaps you like it. Some people do. Uncle was never a rap of good at it, Sylvia explained with a faint suspicion of a smile. So naturally he doesn't like it. Same as the non-dancing man who can't dance, you know. Now Stenness is a good player, Ernest went on. And I can't think why he finds it amusing. He's got all the cards docketed in his head, you know, just like a lot of papers in pigeonholes. That seems to me too much like work, making a toil of pleasure and all that sort of thing. But tonight he won't be playing. He's busy in the study with some papers I asked him to look over. And Torrance is practicing shots in the billiard room, so he won't be playing, either. Arthur. Are you going to play? Arthur looked up crossly from his task. No. He snapped. Can't you see this affair's gone out of gear and I'm trying to put it right? Another shriek from the instrument emphasized his words. Sylvia put her hands over her ears. Will you be long over it, Arthur? She demanded. These howls are terrible. Can't you see I'm doing the best I can? Her brother retorted snappishly. There's nothing so aggravating as to have someone standing over one the whole time asking, will it be all right soon? And when do you think you'll have it in order? Or do you know what's wrong with it? I'm doing the best I can with the thing. Sylvia was evidently used to her brother's outbreaks of temper. With a slight gesture she reassured Arthur that he would not be interrupted again, and then she turned to getting the bridge table arranged. She and Wendover were to play Sir Clinton and Vera Forrest. 
I don't care much for this room at this time of the evening, she said, as she took the cards from their box. The window's almost level with the ground, and that bank of rhododendrons is so close that it blocks the best part of the view. Not much view left at this time of night, Miss Hawkehurst, Wendover said, glancing out. The dusk's so deep that one can hardly see anything in it now. Ernest, who had been shuffling about the room in an aimless fashion for a few moments, suddenly uttered a complaint. It's very stuffy in here. Don't you find it so, Sir Clinton? And you, Miss Forrest? It's a rather hot night. Very close. I do like fresh air, they sometimes laugh at me and call me a fresh air fiend, you know, but I do like a breath of fresh air. Anybody object to the window being opened a bit from the bottom? Let some cooler air in here then. Sylvia looked up from her game. We're right in front of the window, uncle. Perhaps some of us might object to possible drafts. But Ernest refused to allow his desires to be sidetracked in this way. You don't object, Miss Forrest? No. And you people don't, either. You see, Sylvia, nobody minds. I'll just open it a bit. He went forward and threw open the lower sash to its highest range. There. That's much better. He ejaculated, as he retired to his corner again. It won't get so stuffy now. That'll be a great improvement, you'll see. I never could stand stuffy rooms. I remember. Whatever he remembered was drowned by the loud speaker. Arthur had at last completed his repairs and the jazz music of the machine filled the room. There. That's all right now, the mechanic announced at the pitch of his voice in an endeavor to make himself heard. I'll just leave it on, if you don't mind. I want to see if it's properly fixed up. He left the room unobserved by the bridge players, who were intent on their game. Ernest gave a sour look at the loudspeaker, and after bearing it with obvious distaste for some minutes, he also rose. I'm going into the winter garden, he explained as he passed the bridge table. I can't stand the racket that machine makes. It makes my head ache, it gives me a regular piercing pain in the ear to sit near it. I'll just rest quietly in the winter garden and come back again when Arthur's finished with his tinkering at the affair. He stooped over Sir Clinton's shoulder and added in an undertone. I've been very careful lately. I've taken your advice and kept inside the house as much as possible, so as to run no unnecessary risks, you know. He nodded with the air of one who confirms a weighty decision and lumbered off out of the room, leaving Sir Clinton staring after him. My advice? The chief constable reflected with a certain dry amusement. Well, I like his cheek in foisting that onto my shoulders. Wendover was glad that the bridge precluded much conversation. He felt that Sir Clinton had drawn him into a false position that evening, and he had to exert himself so as not to betray his feelings in the matter. Once they sat down, however, the play turned out very even, and he had not much mental energy left for anything beyond his game, which tended to reconcile him to his visit. Both the girls played better than the average, and he was beginning to forget his dissatisfaction as time went on. That's game and rubber, said Sir Clinton, at length, as he looked up from the marker lying beside him. Sylvia glanced at her wristwatch. Shall we play another? She asked. There's plenty of time, unless you wish to get away early. As she spoke she stretched out her arm to lift the marker, but in the middle of the gesture she gave a sharp cry of pain and started up from her chair. Then, as she mechanically brought her hand down again onto the table, Wendover saw a spurt of blood from her right wrist, and, at its source, the brown feathering of one of the poisoned darts embedded in her white skin. For an instant the group around the bridge table was stricken into immobility, while the blood jetted from Sylvia's wrist and stained the cards across which her hand had fallen. The swift incursion of tragedy upon the scene had taken them unawares. A moment or two earlier they had been sitting in safety, intent upon their game. Then, out of the night the tiny missile had sped to its mark, and the King of Terrors had come among them. There had not even been the warning of the air gun's report, for it must have been drowned by the noise of the loudspeaker which still continued to pour out its incongruous flood of dance music. Wendover frozen in his chair, took in the scene almost without knowing that he was observing it, 
the pain-shot face of Sylvia, the horror in Vera Forrest's eyes, the trickle of blood across the littered cards, and the cool visage of Sir Clinton as he leaned over the table towards the wounded girl. Then, as he watched, Sylvia's expression changed. She had seen the poisoned dart in her wrist and now she understood what it meant. Her lips opened as though saying something, then her face grew suddenly white, and she slipped back in her chair. Sir Clinton rose swiftly and lifted the unconscious girl across the room to one of the couches. Wendover noticed that, even in the haste, the chief constable took care to use his own body as a shield, keeping it between Sylvia and the window until he had reached a point which seemed out of range of the assassin. After the brute, Wendover. Sir Clinton ordered, raising his voice above the clamor of the loudspeaker. You may be able to spot him before he gets clear away and shut that window behind you. Galvanized into action by the curt directions, Wendover suddenly ceased to be a mere spectator. Without a word he swung himself through the open window and out into the darkness. Somewhere in the gloom, the unknown murderer must be lurking, waiting perhaps to make sure of his victim with a second shot. Wendover was filled with an anger wholly alien to his usual temperament, and he peered eagerly into the obscurity around him in the hope of glimpsing a shadow moving among the shades. The murder of the two Shandons and the attack upon Ernest had left him emotionally untouched to any real extent. The two Shandons had been hard men, from all he knew of them, and the fate which had overtaken them did not seem altogether out of keeping with people of their type. The attempt on Ernest had been unsuccessful and had made little impression on Wendover's feelings. But this last outrage was in a different category. Even yet he could hardly realize that a deadly effort had been made to injure Sylvia. Sylvia. It was hardly possible for him to feel sure that anyone would attempt to bring down a girl in that terrible fashion. A man, somehow, was different, but he revolted against the idea of cutting short a life like Sylvia's. The aimlessness of it seemed appalling to his mind, and his anger against the hidden assassin rose to a white heat. He moved forward in the direction from which he supposed the shot had come, but in a few steps he ran right into the belt of rhododendrons which stretched parallel with the house on this front. As he did so, the loudspeaker was suddenly shut off and he halted to listen for sounds of movement. Nothing seemed to be stirring. He circled about the rhododendrons, but found no one there. He retraced his steps towards the window. A single dim light shone at the other end of the winter garden, but except for it the house front was dark. The bridge table showed every detail under the lamps of the room beyond the window, an ideal target for the eye of anyone posted in the darkness. Suddenly Wendover's eyes were dazzled by a blaze of light as the whole of the winter garden lamps were switched on. I say, demanded a cautious voice, what does all this mean? What's all this about, I say? Who are you, out there? Wendover's eyes, after an instant or two, grew accustomed to the glare. Looking towards the speaker, he saw Ernest Shandon's figure at the nearest door of the winter garden. Ernest evidently meant to run no risks, for he was holding the door almost closed and had taken shelter behind it while he called out his demand for explanations. Wendover's lips curled contemptuously as he noted the shrinking figure under the lights. I'm Wendover, he announced. Ernest opened the door another inch, though with manifest reluctance. What's it all about? He reiterated, with almost pathetic anxiety. Is there any danger? What are you running around like this for? Where's Driffield? What's happened? Can't you answer, man? Wendover was still more disgusted by the obvious poltroonery of the man who was, nominally at least, his host. Miss Hawkehurst has been shot with one of those poisoned darts. Come along and see if there's anything we can do. Ernest was quite evidently reduced to the last stage of moral prostration by the news. He had not even sufficient nerve left to cover up his cowardice. Eh? What's that? Come out there and be shot at myself. I won't. Well, stay there, then. Wendover growled, continuing his way back to the window through which he had come. I tell you what I'll do. He heard Ernest's voice again. I'll go into the house by the other door of the winter garden and come round to where you are. I'll be under cover the whole way if I do that. 
The sound of the winter garden door closing and the turning of the key in the lock came to Wendover's ears as he reopened the window and climbed through, shutting it behind him. Sylvia was still lying on the couch, evidently unconscious. Sir Clinton was beside her and, much to Wendover's surprise, some lint and bandages had been laid out on the bridge table which had been pulled across the room. Miss Forrest, the chief constable said curtly, will you bring some warm water? Get it yourself. These maids are no use in an emergency. And tell them to get Miss Hawkehurst's room ready for her, immediately. A hot water bottle as quick as they can, and some brandy. Vera was so quick that she had to pause at the door for his last directions. You went over, went on Sir Clinton, get Ardsley on the phone at once. Tell him I want him here at Whistlefield. Wendover halted for a moment. Hadn't I better tell him what he's wanted for? He may be able to bring something with him. It's all arranged. Damnation man. Will you hurry up? Wendover, electrified by the vehemence of the tone, hurried off without a word. When he returned he found that Vera Forrest had carried out her instructions and had come back to see if anything more could be done. Ernest had also found his way into the room and stood staring vacantly at the form of his niece lying so limply on the couch. He was evidently about to open his mouth when Sir Clinton looked up. Everything all right? Thanks, Miss Forrest. You got Ardsley, Wendover? Good so far, then. He was busy bathing the wound with warm water as he spoke. There's just a chance we may be able to do something, he explained going on with his task. By the merest luck, the dart hit the chain of her watch bracelet. It got down between the links and made a nasty wound all the same, but it didn't quite embed itself in the flesh. So there's just the chance that the dose of poison injected may not reach the fatal amount. I can't say. Ardsley will know better when he arrives. He bathed the wound again, then turned to Wendover. You saw no one? Wendover shook his head. It's practically pitch dark tonight. I could see nothing. Sir Clinton thought for a moment. You'll find a flash lamp in my overcoat pocket. Get it, Wendover, and hunt round that bank of rhododendrons to see if you can find the air gun. The brute may have dropped it in the hurry, this time. Don't mind if you make a mess, the gun's more important than any tracks you may obscure in your search. As Wendover moved towards the door, Ernest seemed to come to life. I suppose I ought to help, he said, but it seems to me taking a needless risk, sending anyone out into the dark like that. For all we know the fellow may be out there yet, with his gun. I don't think anyone should go. I'm not going, he concluded simply. Sir Clinton glanced up for a moment and scanned Ernest with eyes that made no effort to conceal their contempt. I didn't ask you to volunteer. Go on, Wendover. I'll come and give you a hand as soon as Ardsley arrives. As Wendover turned to leave the room Stennes's figure appeared at the, the door. It was evident that the secretary had been put on the alert by the hurrying to and fro in the house, and had come to see what was amiss, but apparently he had had no inkling of the real state of affairs. Wendover saw him glance from one to another in the room until at last his eyes lighted upon the limp figure of Sylvia stretched on the couch. Then a flash of expression crossed his features, something which betrayed an intense emotion, but Wendover, at the moment, was unable to interpret it. He stored it up in his memory for future consideration, and then left the room. And now, said Sir Clinton, I think we'd better take Miss Hawkehurst up to her room. We can manage it well enough, and she'd better be there rather than here when she comes to herself again. Under his directions this was carried out. On reaching Sylvia's room, Sir Clinton looked round and then, going over to the window, he endeavoured to scan the surroundings, but it was obviously too dark to see much. I think we'll shift this bed, he suggested, when he came back. It had better be brought over into this corner. Then there will be no possibility of any shot reaching it from the window. One never knows. He paused for a moment. Now I think Miss Forrest and I had better wait here till Miss Hawkehurst comes out of her faint or at any rate till Dr. Ardsley turns up. But we mustn't have a crowd here just now. His manner, rather than his words, cleared the room of his late assistants, 
and he and Vera Forrest were left alone. Sir Clinton, after feeling Sylvia's pulse, succeeded in giving her a few drops of brandy. Soon she stirred faintly. Sir Clinton left the bedside and returned to the window. Down below, at a short distance, he could see Wendover busy with the flash lamp. Quite obviously he had not yet found anything. As Sir Clinton turned away from the window Vera Forrest beckoned him aside. What do you think, Sir Clinton? Is there any chance of her getting over it? Sir Clinton's grave face showed the anxiety which was at work in his mind. I really can't say anything, Miss Forrest, for I don't know anything. The wound isn't as deep as in the other cases. That's always something. She hasn't collapsed immediately, as her uncles did. That's something also. But we'll need to wait for Dr. Ardsley, and even when he comes, I doubt if we shall learn much. He'll at least be able to give her any special treatment that there is. We can only hope for the best. It was clear from his tone that he did not take a light view of the case. He had hardly ceased speaking when they heard the sound of someone racing up the stair. The door was opened brusquely, and Sir Clinton had just time to interpose himself when Arthur Hawkehurst came into the room. The boy was evidently in high excitement. He had learned of the affair downstairs and had rushed up on the spur of the moment. S.H. said Sir Clinton, angrily. Don't break in here like a wild bull. He led the boy gently outside into the hall. Your sister has been shot at like your uncle's, he explained. So far, the thing hasn't killed her, but you needn't take any optimistic view. I've sent for Dr. Ardsley. He knows about that poison, and perhaps he may be able to do something. Arthur seemed unable to control his excitement. But who'd do a thing like that? He demanded. Don't make a row, Sir Clinton ordered, bluntly. We can't stand here holding a committee meeting. There's plenty of time for discussion later on. She's just coming out of a faint, at least it looks like that. Shock of seeing what had hurt her, no doubt, was what sent her off. Nothing to be done now until Ardsley comes. Ah, here he is. Now, Hawkehurst, we'll go, and leave the expert to the business. Ardsley was ascending the stair, carrying a bag with him. He nodded a curt greeting to the two at the head of the stair, gave another interrogative nod as if inquiring which room he should enter, and then disappeared, closing the door behind him. Arthur seemed amazed that Sir Clinton had said nothing as the doctor passed. Aren't you going to tell him about it? He demanded anxiously. He knows all about it, Sir Clinton assured him, but he added no explanations. One moment, before we go. He waited for a minute or two, then the door of Sylvia's room reopened and Ardsley came out. His ordinarily impassive face had an expression of unusual gravity, and in answer to Sir Clinton's interrogation he shook his head doubtfully. One can't tell, was all he would vouchsafe. Get these nurses at once. And with this he turned on his heel and re-entered the room. Sir Clinton put his hands into his pockets and stood for a moment or two as though lost in thought. Then suddenly coming to life again, he made his way to the telephone box, where he shook himself free from Arthur on the plea of an urgent call. When he had given his message through the telephone, the chief constable returned to the room in which the attack had been made. Wendover was apparently still busy with his search among the rhododendrons, Vera Forrest was with Sylvia, but the rest of the Whistlefield group were there, waiting to hear the latest news of the victim. Ernest Shandon's nerves had evidently suffered severely from this fresh shock. He was sitting in his original seat at the back of the room, his head sunk forward and his eyes staring apathetically at the carpet before him, while in his hand he held a glass of neat whiskey which he had just poured out from the decanter beside him. Sir Clinton noticed that the curtains had been drawn in front of the window through which the attack had been made, and he was not far out in believing that this precaution was due to Ernest. It was, in fact, the first thing he had done, once he had found leisure for it. Howard Torrance and Stenness were standing together near the fireplace. Howard, manifestly, was still in ignorance of some details of the tragedy, and he was endeavouring to extract them from Stenness by a series of eager questions. But the secretary, for once, seemed to have lost his efficiency. He was obviously replying almost at random, 
and his whole bearing was that of a man disturbed by a trivial interruption while in the midst of some intense preoccupation with another subject. His appearance suggested that of a man suddenly oppressed by an unexpected and intolerable calamity. Sir Clinton's eyes narrowed as he swept his glance over the secretary's face. He seems to be the most anxious of the lot, he commented to himself. Arthur Hawkehurst had been standing at the window with his back to the room, but as Sir Clinton came in he swung round. His face seemed disfigured by a tumult of emotions, anger, distrust, and anxiety were clearly written on it. Well, he demanded sharply, can you tell us any more? You heard what Ardsley said yourself, Sir Clinton pointed out. I haven't seen him since then. Arthur glared at him with unconcealed fury. It's easy enough to see that it isn't your sister that's lying at death's door. You mightn't be so cool about it then. He turned back to the window again, and stared out into the night. What has happened? Howard Torrance demanded. You're the only one here who saw it all, Sir Clinton. Someone took advantage of the music from the loudspeaker to steal up close to the window, there, which Mr. Shandon insisted on opening. An air gun dart was fired into the room and struck Miss Hawkehurst. Luckily, it happened to hit her wrist just where there was some protection, the chain of her watch bracelet, and that prevented it from going as deep as it might. But if any poison has got into the wound, it may be a serious matter, most serious. That's all I know except that I got Dr. Ardsley over immediately, and he has her in his charge. Is there any hope that it won't be fatal this time? Howard Torrance asked, anxiously. Sir Clinton shook his head. I know as little as you do, I got the dart out almost immediately, so perhaps the poison hadn't time to get in its work. That seems to offer some chance of escape. But you'll need to wait for the expert's views. I really know nothing and you don't seem to be doing anything, snarled Arthur from the window. Before Sir Clinton needed to reply, the door opened and Wendover hurried into the room. He was dishevelled, his tie was loose, and his dinner jacket showed in some places smears of green and brown which he had evidently picked up during his prolonged search. But in his hand he carried the thing Sir Clinton wanted, the air gun. Good man! The chief constable commented, as his eyes rested on the weapon. At the exclamation Arthur turned back towards the room. His face changed as he caught sight of the thing that Wendover carried. Where did you get that, eh? That's my best air gun. That's the thing that may have killed your sister, then, said Wendover, looking mistrustfully at Arthur's disturbed face. I found it in that clump of rhododendrons out there. It had been jammed right into the middle of the bushes, that's why it took so long to find. He looked Arthur up and down for a moment, then, disregarding the owner's outstretched hand, he passed the air gun to Sir Clinton, who took it from him without a word. Arthur stepped forward angrily as though to recover his property, but at that moment a fresh interruption occurred. Again the door opened, but this time the grim figure of Ardsley appeared on the threshold. He waited for a moment until he saw that he had secured the attention of them all, then he turned towards Sir Clinton and gave him his verdict. This is a bad business. Of course, she's still alive, and there's a chance yet. It's a pity you didn't think of a tourniquet at the moment, prevent any risk of the stuff spreading, since it's an isolated limb. But there's no use grumbling now. We can only wait and see if she pulls through. It's a bad business. Sir Clinton nodded. Have you everything you need? The nurses will be here as soon as possible. Miss Forrest will do in the meantime. One thing, there must be absolute quietness in the house. I can't have my patient disturbed in the slightest degree. She's unconscious again, but there must be no risk of disturbing her later on. Complete quiet, or I won't answer for anything. He turned and left the room without waiting for any questions. The gravity of his expression was enough to show them that he had no great hope for Sylvia's safety. Chapter 13 the dart. The period immediately following the attack upon Sylvia was one of intense inquietude in Wendover's mind. Up to that point he had persuaded himself that the affairs at Whistlefield would eventually prove to be linked up in some way with the Hackleton case. The connection of some of the incidents, the attack on Ernest Shandon, for one, 
had certainly been obscure, but Wendover had nursed an irrational belief that in the end all the threads would lead back to Hackleton, and that the whole mystery would find a simple explanation which would bring it within the borders of normal motives and sane sequences of actions. The latest tragedy, however, could not be squared with any of his preconceived ideas. What possible relationship could exist between Hackleton and Sylvia which would make her removal essential to the financier? It was hardly likely that either she or Ernest had been the repository of Neville Shandon's secrets. But if Hackleton dropped out of the piece, then the whole affair seemed to lose any thread of purpose and to become a mere massacre perpetrated by some being urged on by motives which lay outside the bounds of reason. Instead of a coldly calculating criminal, Wendover seemed to find himself confronted by a creature beyond the pale of humanity, a thing that slew at random out of sheer lust for death. His own normal mind revolted from such a monster, and he strove hard to piece the evidence together again in some way which would eliminate this nightmare figure and replace it by a criminal actuated by motives which sane intellects could grasp. As soon as he got Sir Clinton alone after the tragedy at Whistlefield, he had done his best to extort information, but in this he had failed completely. Every one of his inquiries was met by a curt denial of any ulterior knowledge, though it was manifest that Sir Clinton was concentrating his whole mind on the latest developments in the Whistlefield affair. Despite this blank negation, however, the squire got the impression that the chief constable's anxiety centred round Sylvia, rather than the Whistlefield case as a whole. From an unguarded word he inferred that Sir Clinton had, somehow or other, taken a risk, and that the results had been very different from what he had expected. Something had cut across Sir Clinton's schemes and had shaken his confidence. Even when he abandoned his fruitless inquisition and went to bed, Wendover was unable to free himself from the latest tragedy. His mind insisted on conjuring up pictures, some of them memories, others imaginary scenes in which the unknown murderer played his part. He saw the bridge table at the end of the rubber, with the cards of the last trick lying still ungathered, Sir Clinton putting down the marker, a cigarette smouldering on the ashtray, Vera Forrest shuffling the pack for the next deal. Nothing could have been more peaceful. Then, in a flash, came the transformation scene. He lived again through the nightmare moment when the lethal darts sped in upon them from the outer dark, changing their fancied security into a thing of horror and peril and from this his imagination passed to that lurking monster in the gloom beyond the window, a vague, featureless figure, crouching among the rhododendrons, lifting the thin barrel of the air gun in search of the appointed victim. In uneasy visions such as these, his night dragged slowly on. Morning brought Wendover no release from his anxiety. Before he had come downstairs, Sir Clinton had been busy with the telephone, and his face was sufficient to show that he had had bad news. Wendover hardly dared to ask what it was, for his guest's features plainly betrayed that the worst might be expected. Ardsley's been telephoning, Sir Clinton explained briefly. She's much worse. There was a bad collapse in the early morning and they just managed to pull her through. Luckily the nurses were on the spot, so everything was done that could be done. But Ardsley seems to have very little hope now. He thinks the dose of the poison must have been bigger than we thought. He bit his lip, seemed on the verge of saying something else, then ended by changing his mind and choosing other words, we must go across there after breakfast, squire, I must see Ardsley. You've no idea how this affair worries me. I think I have a fair notion, Wendover replied. I've had a pretty bad night over it myself. It's a damnable affair. Sir Clinton nodded absent-mindedly. He was evidently lost in his thoughts. By the set of his mouth, Wendover could guess that they were anything but pleasant. Though he hardly admitted it to himself, Sir Clinton's behaviour was another factor which had loosened Wendover's grip on the normal world. Hitherto the chief constable had seemed so sure of his case that he had treated it almost lightly, but now it was self-evident that something had gone wrong. Things had not worked out according to plan. The tragedy which he had predicted had forced itself into being— but now that it had come he appeared unable to act the part of the deus ex machina which he seemed to have meant to play. This sudden change disturbed Wendover deeply. The man on whom he had been relying to clear up the mystery appeared to be perplexed and anxious instead of cool and resolute. When they reached Whistlefield, 
Ernest Shandon was the first person who came to meet them. This is a terrible business, he lamented, as he came into the study where they were. It's a dreadful affair, really. A dreadful affair. Ardsley's very down about it, very down. You know, he wouldn't do for a doctor in practice. He's most unsympathetic. Most doctors are careful, they don't blurt things out in the callous sort of way that Ardsley does. He doesn't think about one's feelings in the slightest. One expects a little decent circumlocution from a doctor, but there's none of that about him. I asked him this morning if Sylvia had passed a good night, and he just glared at me and snarled that she was lucky to be alive at all, snarled it out as if she had been one of the dogs he cuts up. Is that the way to break bad news to a relation? I call it beastly. He never thinks of what it means to us. It's just a case to him, I suppose. But look what it means to us. Sylvia runs the house so well. I don't know what we'll do without her. Sir Clinton had let him run on, but quite evidently he had no intention of wasting much time listening to Ernest's lamentations. Miss Forrest must be resting just now, I suppose? Yes, Ernest assured him, she was up helping Ardsley until the nurses came, and after that she didn't seem able to sleep, so she sat up for a while. Ardsley came down and found her in the early morning, so he sent her off to bed. So he told me. I had gone to bed myself some time before. Sir Clinton made no comment and Ernest proceeded with his complaints. What I feel is that the police aren't doing anything. Why haven't you arrested somebody? My nerves are beginning to wear thin under this strain, I tell you. Here we have some murderer haunting the neighborhood. He kills my brothers, he attacks me, he brings my niece to death's door, and all the time the police look on with their hands in their pockets. What are they paid for? That's what I ask you. Why don't they lay hands on the fellow? What sort of a life do you think I'm leading just now? Every time I go outside the house I have the feeling that the scoundrel may be lurking behind the next bush, getting his gun ready. That's a pretty state of things. And not a finger do you lift to help. I offered you a guard of constables for Whistlefield not so long ago, Mr. Shandon. You refused it then. I'm sorry it isn't available now. I have other work for my men at present. Ernest was somewhat taken aback by this reminder. So you did, so you did. I'd forgotten that. Sir Clinton seemed inclined to accept this as an apology. I should like to see Mr. Stenness for a moment in private, if you don't mind, Mr. Shandon. Could you send him to me? Ernest evidently felt that he had let his tongue run away with him. Possibly some faint realization of the display of cowardice which he had made was dawning upon his mind. At any rate, he hastened to meet Sir Clinton's wish. I'll hunt him up and send him to you, he announced with surprising conciseness, and he left the room without further talk. While they were waiting for Stenness the door opened and Arthur Hawkehurst came in. Rather to Wendover's surprise he showed no trace of the ill feeling which he had displayed so strongly on the previous night. Instead, he seemed rather shamefaced, and he opened in an unexpected vein. I behaved like a young cub last night, Sir Clinton, he admitted frankly. I dare say I said a lot of things that I shouldn't have said. But you know quite well his teeth showed in an engaging smile, I was badly upset. Anyone might be, I think. Poor Sylvia. I'm deuced fond of her, you know. She's about the only person in the world that matters a tinker's curse to me. So naturally I wasn't quite level-headed, and I dare say I said things I shouldn't have said. That's all right, Sir Clinton assured him. I understood perfectly how you felt. Forget it, and don't worry. You've trouble enough without bothering about trifles just now. Arthur nodded a gloomy acquiescence. Have you any notion why the thing was done? Sir Clinton was careful not to give a direct answer. We're doing our best. Arthur's eye lighted up. I wish you'd let me take a hand. Perhaps I could be of some use? Not just at present, I'm afraid. Arthur took the rejection badly. Nothing to hinder my working on my own, then, is there? You can't prevent that. And if I come across the brute you needn't expect to be allowed to butt in then, you know. I'll tackle him myself. Hanging's too good for him. 
I agree with you there, Sir Clinton said unguardedly. Then he added with a faint smile, we're speaking quite unofficially, of course. Arthur looked up suspiciously. I'm not quite sure what you mean. But what I mean's quite plain and can be put into plain English. If I can lay my hands on the man who tried to murder Sylvia, he'll wish for a decent hanging before I'm done with him. I'll. That's enough, Mr. Hawkehurst, Sir Clinton interrupted sharply. We don't want to hear about it. Arthur's temper boiled up at the words. Wendover, glancing at his face, saw the features contorted in hardly restrained fury. With an effort, the boy fought down his anger until he could speak. If anything happens to Sylvia I'll get the brute yet, and then he'll wish he'd never been born. That's that. He swung round on his heel and left the room. Sir Clinton sighed slightly as the door closed. Oh, Lord! He exclaimed softly, as if to himself. I hadn't reckoned on that. This is growing devilishly complicated. Wendover had pricked up his ears. What's the trouble now? Sir Clinton seemed to realize that he had spoken his thoughts aloud. It's another factor that I hadn't allowed for, he admitted. But he refused to divulge anything further, and Wendover had to content himself with the cryptic phrase. Stenness did not keep them waiting long. When he came into the study, Wendover was surprised to see the change which the night seemed to have made in the secretary's appearance. He was heavy-eyed, and his features had a drawn expression as though he had passed through some great strain. I suppose we all look a bit like that, after this affair, Wendover commented to himself. Clinton's half killing himself with anxiety, young Hawkehurst's far from normal, and I suppose I must look a bit white about the gills myself. It's only to be expected. Sir Clinton wasted no time on preliminaries, but came to the point at once. Mr. Shandon told us that you knew the contents of Roger Shandon's will. Can you give me the gist of it? It's not a confidential document now, of course. There's a copy of it in the safe here, Stenness explained. You can look it over if you like. Thanks. But if you can remember the main points it may save me the trouble of reading through it. Stenness took a key from his pocket and went across to open the safe which was built into the wall of the study. The will's simple enough. All the property is to be divided equally between Neville Shandon, Ernest Shandon, Miss Hawkehurst, and Arthur Hawkehurst. There's the usual provision about heirs and survivors of that group. What I particularly want to know is whether there's any residuary legatee mentioned, anybody who takes the remainder of the estate after all other legacies have been paid in full. I don't remember any provision of that sort, Stenness admitted, searching among the papers in the safe. Here's the copy of the will if you'd care to look at it. He handed it over to Sir Clinton who unfolded it and began to read. He left you nothing, did he? The chief constable asked casually, as he continued his study of the document. Stenness was plainly surprised by the question. No. Why should he? I've only been with him a year or two. I'm not an old family retainer who's earned a pension. As a matter of fact, there are no bequests of the kind. So I see, Sir Clinton agreed when he had finished his reading. It's a very short will, not complicated by any of the provisions they often put into these things. He seemed to ponder over the matter for a moment or two. I had rather expected to find a residuary legatee in the thing somewhere, but you're quite right, there's nothing of the sort mentioned. You don't happen to know anything about Neville Shandon's will, do you? It wouldn't fall into your province. Stenness shook his head. I never read it. But I witnessed it, as it happens and the impression I got from a glance at the last page was that it may have run on the same lines as Roger's. You can easily get a copy of it once it's filed, if you need it. Sir Clinton handed back the will and rose to his feet as the secretary restored the document to the safe. I see you have a key of that thing? Stenness closed the safe and put the key back into his pocket. Yes, Mr. Shandon told me to keep this one. I've been arranging the papers for him and it was more convenient that I should have the key. It saved him the bother of always handing it over when I needed it. You hadn't a key in Roger Shandon's time? No, 
Roger was rather a different sort of person. By the way, Mr. Stenness, are you staying on here as secretary to Ernest Chandon? Stenness seemed slightly taken aback by the question. There's no definite arrangement, so far. I'm staying until the estate affairs have been cleared up, but after that I doubt if I shall remain here. I can do better than this. I suppose you could, Sir Clinton agreed indifferently. He looked at his watch. I want to see Dr. Ardsley now. I'm rather in a hurry at the present, but there are one or two more questions I want to put to you sometime, Mr. Stenness. Will you be free after dinner tonight? Very well, I'll come across then. Now, if you could let Dr. Ardsley know I'm here. Stenness was evidently a prompt messenger, for Ardsley appeared almost at once. Wendover scanned his face eagerly as he came into the room. Here was the person who might be able to set their minds at ease. But Ardsley's countenance gave him no cause for raising his spirits. It betrayed nothing but gloom and anxiety. She's much worse. I'd hoped for a rally after that attack in the night, but she hasn't pulled herself together. Tell us plainly what you think, demanded Sir Clinton. You needn't beat about the bush where we're concerned. Ardsley's face seemed to grow, if anything, graver than before. I can hold out no great hope. Frankly, I think it will be all up soon, tonight, perhaps. No one seemed inclined to speak. Wendover was trying to force himself to face what now seemed inevitable. Death often came swiftly, but the circumstances of Sylvia's tragedy gave it a quality which ordinary deaths do not possess. He could hardly assure himself that the whole thing was not a nightmare. There seemed to be something so aimless in the whole business, the killing of a young girl against whom no one could conceivably harbor any personal grudge. The inhuman purposelessness which had cut Sylvia down on the threshold of her life seemed more terrible to him than any planned scheme would have done, for a calculated crime would imply a motive, whereas this deed seemed to have arisen out of mere chaos, something outside normal things. Sir Clinton took a step towards the door and then seemed to change his mind. Do you think you could get some vinegar and some washing soda? He asked, turning to Ardsley. There's something I'd like to be sure about, and it might be as well that an expert should see it. Ardsley had no difficulty in procuring what was wanted. As the doctor in charge of Sylvia, he had only to ask for anything. A couple of tumblers and a water carafe were brought as well, at Sir Clinton's request. Now you can put your back against the door, squire. We don't want any visitors. From a tiny glass bottle which he drew from his pocket, the chief constable extracted one of the illumined darts. This is the one which wounded Miss Hawkehurst, he explained, as he dropped it into a glass of water. Now we'll need to give it time. He stirred it round occasionally, and gradually a faint bluish tinge communicated itself to the water. Ardsley was scrutinizing the glass with deep interest, but his face showed nothing of the thoughts in his mind. Now we add a drop of vinegar, squire, said Sir Clinton, suiting the action to the word. As the vinegar mixed with the solution, Wendover saw a change in the tint, a pale red replaced the original blue. Now some washing soda, for a change, said Sir Clinton, dropping in a crystal and swirling the liquid round in the glass. As he did so, the blue tinge returned to the solution. Ardsley nodded approvingly. Litmus, obviously. That clinches it. You must be a bit of a chemist to have hit on that tip. Sir Clinton made no reply, but he cautioned Wendover to bear the test in mind. If that's all you want, I'll go back to Miss Hawkehurst, Ardsley said, as soon as Sir Clinton ceased speaking. We're going back to the Grange, now, Sir Clinton explained. If you need me, you've only to ring up. I thought you were in a hurry, Wendover said in some surprise when he found that Sir Clinton seemed to have nothing on hand on their return to the Grange. You broke off your talk with Stenness on that excuse. Why not have finished it at the time, instead of trailing over there again later in the day? I'm worried about Miss Hawkehurst, Squire, and I prefer to get my news direct from Ardsley rather than over the phone. You didn't get much out of him this morning, Wendover complained. And I can't think why you put that man into the business at all. It seems to me tempting providence. Why, 
He's quite possibly the source of the original Kurari, for all you know, he's one of the suspects. He's not on my list of suspects, Squire, and if he's on yours, you may score him off straight away. That's definite. As to my using him, who could do the work better? What would a country G. P. make of Miss Hawkehurst's case? Nothing whatever. You can't expect rural medicos to be the last word in the study of out-of-the-way poisons. It's not reasonable to ask it. Wendover's increasing disquietude found its relief in speech at last. I can't see what your aim is in this affair, Clinton. You say you know the murderer. Why don't you arrest him at once? You claimed to know him days ago, and yet you did nothing. And now you've let things drift, and the result has been this attack on Sylvia Hawkehurst. Why, you're responsible for that. You were criminally careless with these poison darts, leaving them lying about for anyone to pick up. Sir Clinton made no defense. Instead, he turned Wendover's vehemence into another channel. It's easy to say arrest somebody. Suppose you were in my shoes, squire, and you wanted to be absolutely on the safe side, whom would you arrest at this very moment? Under the spur of the direct question, Wendover had a flash of illumination. Ernest Shandon, he said. I've just been thinking over things, and I've seen one or two points in a fresh light. Who was it opened the window last night and so made it possible for the murderer to shoot into the room? Ernest Shandon. Who was out of the room when the shot was fired? Ernest Shandon. Where was he? In the winter garden, which has a door opening close to the bank of rhododendrons in which the murderer hid himself. Who had access to that stock of Korari in the museum? Ernest Shandon. Sir Clinton failed to repress a smile, though he did his best. And who was attacked himself, in the maze? Ernest Shandon. And who was sitting with a nail in his boot on the public highway that afternoon when his brothers were killed? Ernest Shandon. Let's complete the tale, you know, before we begin to talk about arrests. The real truth of the matter is that Ernest Shandon has annoyed you by his cowardice and his general selfishness, and, therefore, you think he'd be all the better for a hanging. You're beginning to see red here, just as you saw red in Ardsley's case. Wendover sullenly admitted his blunder. But there's another person who ought to be under observation, young Hawkehurst, he continued. That young beggar seems to me hardly sane at times. Look at him this morning. That cerebrospinal affair has affected him far more than I supposed. He broke off, struck by a fresh idea. Is he the person you have your eye on, Clinton? I never thought of that. Now that might account for the thing that's been puzzling me, the damned aimlessness of all the Whistlefield affair. It's just the sort of thing a lunatic would do. And they say that in a sleepy sickness case, if it turns to homicidal mania, the creature may go for the nearest relations. Just what's happened at Whistlefield. And it was he who put on the loudspeaker last night and so covered any noise he might have made in getting into position outside the window. I hadn't thought of that before. And it was his air gun that I found in the rhododendrons. This time, Sir Clinton did not smile. I don't mind admitting to you, squire, that young Hawkehurst is one of my difficulties. Wendover returned to his original charge, well, I can't understand what you're driving at, Clinton. On the face of things, it seems to me that you've gambled away that poor girl's life merely to get a case that you can prove, and now you're no nearer it than you were before. Sir Clinton's face grew very grave. You've touched a sore spot there, squire. But did it never occur to you that I didn't expect an attack on Miss Hawkehurst? What I did expect was something quite different. Didn't it strike you as peculiar that I angled for that invitation to play bridge when it obviously wasn't the sort of thing that one expects? I had to put on a pretty tough hide to wangle that with a straight face. Yes, Wendover confirmed, it was a piece of rank bad taste and I was surprised at your doing it. It was. And I'm not usually celebrated for that kind of thing. Don't you see what I was driving at, squire? I expected the next attack to be made on myself and I took good care to make an opportunity for it by going on to the murderer's own ground. The whole bridge party affair was a plant of mine to make myself a good target for the air gun expert. My godfathers. 
Wendover ejaculated in surprise, I never thought that was what you were after. You've got fair nerves, Clinton, to offer yourself up like that to be shot at. I'd rather take it when I was ready for it than have it unexpectedly, hence the bridge party. I felt he'd hardly be able to resist the chance of a sitting shot. Hmm. I don't know that I'd have been able to screw myself up to that point. Of course you would. You didn't hesitate over the risk of going after that fellow, through the window. Yes, Wendover admitted, but that was in hot blood, which is rather different. Sir Clinton brushed this aside. The trouble is that I didn't get what I wanted, after all. Miss Hawkehurst was hit. But you may remember that just when the brute pulled the trigger, she leaned slightly forward and put out her hand, whilst I happened to lean back. The dart went past you, and it struck her arm, but I can't for the life of me be sure whether that was an accident or not. If I knew whether that shot was meant for me or for her, I'd know rather more about the case than I do, and I'd be in an easier frame of mind, I can tell you. A fresh point seemed to occur to him. By the way, Squire, your surmise about the fate of the air gun in the first attacks turns out to be correct. My men have been dragging the river near the bank at the boathouse, and we've got the air gun that killed the two Shandons. The murderer must have pitched it into the water just as you suggested. Wendover was distinctly pleased at this tribute to his acuteness. Is there anything identifiable about it? He demanded. It seems to have come from the Whistlefield Armory, Sir Clinton replied. Confound them, I wish they hadn't gone in so strong for air guns. It makes things more difficult. Chapter 14 The Forged Check Sir Clinton had yet another surprise in store for his host. Just before dinner, he apparently made up his mind to ring up Whistlefield, and to Wendover's astonishment he suggested that the squire should accompany him to the telephone. You'll hear only one side of the conversation, he said, with a rather grim expression, but I think it may interest you. And perhaps it will be just as well to have a witness to testify about my end of the wire. I wish we had two receivers, for then you would have heard the whole thing. He got the connection in a moment or two and then astounded Wendover by asking for Ernest Shandon instead of Ardsley. After a few minutes, Wendover heard the beginning of the conversation. Sir Clinton Drifield speaking. Mr. Shandon, you must treat this as absolutely confidential. Absolutely for yourself. Not a breath of it to anyone else, you understand? I want you to keep an eye on your secretary. Yes, Stenness. I want him kept under observation. If you see him leave the house, ring me up immediately. Yes, at once. It won't be for long. I'm coming across very shortly. I didn't catch that. Yes, you weren't far out in your suspicions. Most fortunate you mentioned the matter of the check. Anything further? Do you mean about the murderer? Oh, I think I'll have him tomorrow, quite possibly, if he doesn't bolt. If he doesn't bolt, I said. That's the only thing I'm afraid of. Yes, I'm sure that would interest you. After all, one's skin is one's dearest possession. Good night. We shall be across shortly after dinner. Wendover had been able to gather the gist of the conversation from the side which he had heard. You're afraid of Stenness doing a bolt. And you think he's the man you're after? Really, squire, you must take a reef in your questions, Sir Clinton said, reproachfully. I stretched a point to let you hear that talk, and I certainly didn't intend to stand a cross-examination about it. You must make what you can out of it for yourself. And that reminds me, I'm afraid you can't be present when I interview Master Stenness. You'll just have to be a private caller this evening and wait for results till later. Wendover was not particularly pleased with this last news. He had evidently counted on hearing what Sir Clinton had to say to the secretary. However, he realized that he was in the hands of the chief constable and must do as he was told, so when they arrived at Whistlefield, he asked for Ernest Shandon while Sir Clinton went into the study to interview Stenness. The secretary arrived in a few moments. He was still looking very anxious, perhaps even more anxious than in the morning. Sir Clinton wasted no time but came to grips with the subject at once. Now, Mr. Stenness, I've one or two questions to put to you. 
I may as well caution you that anything you say may be used against you if you are put on your trial. Stenness's face betrayed less surprise than might have been expected. You say if, but perhaps you mean when? I'm picking my words with some care, Sir Clinton assured him. I mean if. The point's still in doubt, but I want to play the game with you and take no improper advantage. The imperturbable face of the secretary showed neither relief nor depression. It's very good of you, he said in a colorless voice. Sir Clinton considered for a moment. Stenness moved over to a chair and sat down. I think I can put my cards on the table in your case, Stenness, the chief constable said at length. Nothing I'm going to tell you will be news to you, and there seems no reason why I shouldn't say it. Stenness looked up indifferently. His mind seemed to be occupied with something quite apart from the affair in hand. Go on, he said, apathetically. Here are the facts, then, Sir Clinton began. You were employed here as Roger Shandon's secretary. In that capacity, you seem to have had access to his checkbooks. It's not a usual thing, but I have sound reasons for supposing that it was so in your case. Stenness nodded his assent. I don't deny that, he admitted. You have the key of the safe, haven't you? Would you mind seeing if you can find the checkbook that Roger Shandon used last? Stenness walked over to the safe, opened it, and after a few moments' search he unearthed the checkbook. Now, Sir Clinton went on, would you mind turning up the counterfoil numbered 60,073? Stenness looked up without showing any emotion on his features. There's no such counterfoil in the book, he admitted. But you find 60,072 and 60,074 there? Yes. Rather a peculiar state of affairs, isn't it? It is. Sir Clinton turned to another subject. There's a bundle of returned checks in that drawer of the writing desk, isn't there? There is. Do you want it? Sir Clinton seemed to disregard the question. Would it surprise you, Stenness, if you learned that one of these checks has been abstracted and that it can't be found? The bank returned it in due course for all that. Stenness gazed stonily at his interlocutor. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Sir Clinton paused for a moment before continuing. When he spoke again it was in a different vein. These are all plain facts. Now we come to hypothesis, and of course the ground's not quite so firm. I think, if you don't mind, we might put it in the form of one of these John Doe and Richard Rowe cases, lest you should think. He left the sentence incomplete. Now, he began briskly, Let's suppose that John Doe is a rich man who has made his money in rather peculiar ways, like the late Roger Shandon, for example. He employs a secretary. I think one may reasonably suppose that a secretary in that case would need to be somebody who could shut his eyes when necessary, and who wouldn't be apt to judge things too rigidly. In fact, Stenness, he would need to be a fairly unscrupulous fellow himself. Stenness nodded indifferently. Go on. I'm putting a hypothetical case, remember, Sir Clinton cautioned him. This is what might be said, I don't necessarily accept it myself. I'm only trying to show you how it could be made to look, you understand? Well, then, this secretary, Richard Rowe, sooner or later sees the chance which Providence has thrown in his way. His employer is in the habit of drawing bearer checks for large amounts, some thousands, from time to time. And, rather carelessly, he has dropped into the way of getting his secretary to cash them for him and bring him the money. So the bank is accustomed to paying over these things to the secretary, and no questions asked. Stenness gave no sign of special interest. His normal reserve was sufficient to veil his thoughts. The secretary, we may assume, is an acute fellow. I think we may take it that he may see a chance when it comes his way but forgery requires a certain amount of manual skill if it is carried out in some ways, and possibly the secretary is sufficiently acute to distrust his powers as a forger. But it's always possible to trace a signature. Sir Clinton pulled out his cigarette case and lit a cigarette before going on. He seemed determined to infuse informality into the proceedings. It's always possible to trace a signature, he continued. But one needs a model signature for that, 
a signature from a check, of course, because sensible people don't use their letter signature on their checks. They have a special one with some specific trick in it, the position of a dot, or something of the sort. I hope I'm not boring you with these elementary things. Not at all, said Stenness, with a certain show of polite interest. The model, in the case of the secretary Richard Rowe, went on Sir Clinton, could easily be chosen from one of the old checks returned by the bank. He had access to these, we may suppose. But then comes in a point which is sure to strike his acute mind. A man never writes his signature twice in precisely the same way, there's always a faint difference between any two signatures. Hence, if two checks turn up with identical signatures, a sharp detective might suspect something wrong. You follow me? Stenness nodded in silence. The acute secretary, Richard Rowe, therefore traces his employer's signature from one of these old checks. And to cover his trail, to make certain that the thing cannot be shown to be a traced signature, he then destroys the old check. Thus there are not two identical signatures in existence, and the only thing missing is a cancelled check, not a thing anyone is likely to make a fuss about at the worst, even if its disappearance is noted. I make myself clear. Quite, said Sternness, still with his air of formal interest. So far, then, Sir Clinton went on, all is plain sailing, but now comes a sticky bit. In fact, the sticky bit of the whole affair. Every check has its counterfoil, and Mr. John Doe, the employer, has had an awkward habit of always filling in his counterfoils. Hence when Mr. Richard Rowe traces his employer's signature on, let us say, check no. 60,073, he has to do something about the counterfoil of that check. If he leaves it blank, it will catch the attention of the good Mr. Doe the next time he uses the checkbook. If the acute secretary fudges an entry on counterfoil no. 60,073, then Mr. Doe, who is by no means a dull fellow, may spot the thing and cause trouble. What is to be done? The obvious thing is to remove counterfoil no. 60,073 from the checkbook and trust that its absence will not be noticed. I think that is the course I'd have followed myself if I had got into that fix. Sir Clinton seemed for a moment to lose interest in his narrative. He sat for a time in silence, eyeing the secretary as though he hoped to surprise something. But Stenness showed no sign of either guilt or confusion. I congratulate you on your nerves, Stenness, Sir Clinton began once more. Now that's an hypothesis which I should not be very loath to adopt as an explanation of this affair of the checks. It seems to me to cover the ground neatly. In fact, I'm quite convinced that it's a good hypothesis so far as it goes. But some people might be prepared to carry it a stage further. I'll just sketch out what they would say. At this point Stenner seemed to find some interest in the matter. He sat up and looked across at the chief constable. Please go on, he requested. We have assumed that Richard Rowe is an acute person. Now an alert mind might quite conceivably see a further step which would bring him on to safer ground. If things took their course, the forgery would be spotted in a very short time. One can't take thousands out of a man's account without raising inquiry. So, normally, the reasonable thing to do would be to bolt and chance getting out of the country with the cash. That's what would occur to most people at once. But there's another way of making sure of things. Sir Clinton's voice took on a graver tone. Let us suppose that immediately the check has been cashed, the employer happens to die. What evidence of forgery is left then? None whatever, if the tracing of the signature has been decently executed. The supposed writer is dead, and no one else can deny his signature. And the check, we assume, has been cashed before the death takes place. On that basis, there would be no need for any flight on the part of the forger. He would simply have to sit tight and behave normally. Sir Clinton surprised a fresh look on Stenness's face. It was only a fleeting change, but it was quite unmistakable. But the secretary remained obstinately mute and waited for the rest of the argument. That's assuming a natural death of the employer. But such coincidences are rather rare. An acute mind would not count on a chance like that. However, rare as such coincidences may be, they are not beyond possibility, 
if a human agent should happen to take a hand in the business. Suppose that the acute Richard Rowe perceived this, and decided that it was worth his while to produce that coincidence by murdering his employer. Sir Clinton swung round in his chair, surprised by the opening of the door. Ardsley stood on the threshold, and a glance at his face showed that something serious had happened. It's all up, Sir Clinton. They can pull down the blinds. Miss Hawkehurst? Was all Sir Clinton could say. Ardsley made a gesture of despair. Some things are beyond us, he said despondently. Chapter 15. The Secretary's Affairs. Sir Clinton received Ardsley's news almost as if he had feared that the end was inevitable. He made no attempt to express his feelings, however. I think you'd better let the others know, he suggested. Ardsley agreed, with a faint grimace of reluctance for the task, and left the room. Stenness had listened to the interchange between the two with an air of a man trying to persuade himself that he is in a dream and that by a violent effort he may be able to shake off his nightmare. At last he seemed to master his feelings. It's all over, is it? He asked in a choked voice, as though hoping even at the last moment to be reassured by good news. It's all over, Sir Clinton admitted, gravely. Stenner seemed to pull himself together. Then in that case, he said, there seems to be no reason why I shouldn't make a clean breast of things. Nothing matters much, now, and you may as well get the true story. It'll make no difference to me. Sir Clinton made a vague gesture of assent, but refrained from speaking. After a moment or two, Stenness began. This is how it happened. Not so long ago, I was a cub with no near relations to look after me and keep me straight. I'm not whining, I'm simply explaining. I had a few thousands of capital, and naturally a good deal of it got frittered away. I learned something about the world in the process, so perhaps it wasn't a total loss. Sir Clinton noticed that even at this stage Stenness retained his conciseness and stuck to the main facts. The secretary was sparing him useless details, and, as he had said, he was not whining over his losses. When I had been at it for a year or two, I had run myself down to a little over five thousand pounds. That's a good enough nest egg, but I hadn't the sense to see it in that light. I wanted a good deal more than three or four hundred a year. So I looked about for some way of increasing my capital. A faintly contemptuous expression crossed his face. I must have been a very green hand in those days. I had a sort of trustfulness which I've lost since then. To make a long story short I was swindled out of that five thousand. I was so green that at the time I didn't realize who was at the back of the swindle. All I met were agents of the big fish in the background. They cleaned me out, almost completely. He shifted slightly in his chair as though the recollection made him uncomfortable. I had to do something for a living, and somehow I dropped into secretarial work, the kind where it's more important that a man should have a decent appearance than that he should know his work. But by that time I realized that I'd have to work for a living, and I sobered up. I took things seriously and picked up all I could. I turned into quite a decently efficient secretary. Sir Clinton nodded. It was no more than Stenness's due. I drifted about from post to post, until a couple of years ago I dropped into Roger Shandon's place. I learned a lot with him. It was a perfect education, on certain lines. I can quite imagine that, Sir Clinton interjected. He was a damned scoundrel, Stenness pronounced, without heat. But I picked up a lot about the seamy side of affairs from things that passed through my hands. It was interesting, even at first. And then, it got more interesting. He shifted again in his chair so as to look Sir Clinton in the face. I came across a name in his correspondence, the name of one of the fellows who had helped to rook me of that last five thousand. That put me on the alert. I began to hunt things up. It took me a good while, and none of it was in any way explicit, you understand, but I had sense enough to put two and two together and fill up the blanks. My late employer was the man who had been behind the ramp that cleared me of the last of my cash. You couldn't have expected me to guess that, Sir Clinton said, as though defending himself. I knew there was more behind this business than appeared on the surface, 
but naturally I'd no inkling of anything of that sort. Sten Ness paid no attention to the interruption. I suppose my training under Roger Shandon had taken the refined edge off any honesty I had. Or else it had left the honesty but blunted my respect for the conventions, if you like it better that way. It seemed to me, anyhow, a simple enough state of affairs. This fellow Shandon had picked my pocket, at least that was what it amounted to in practice, though I doubt if I could have charged him with fraud and brought it home to him. Well, I saw no particular reason why he should get away with my money. He'd taken advantage of my stupidity or trustfulness, or whatever you like to call it. I decided to pay him back in his own coin. I might have milked him of a fair extra sum as a fine, but that didn't suit my book. I've got a peculiar brand of conscience, and I made up my mind that I'd take precisely the cash that he cheated me out of. No doubt the odd figures on the check surprised you. No, Sir Clinton objected. I simply took it that Shandon wasn't in the habit of drawing checks for round thousands and that you filled in an odd figure so as not to make the check look uncommon. I'd have done that in any case, of course, Stenness explained, but as it happened, the exact sum he took from me originally made a likely enough figure, and I stuck to it. I didn't even fine him a sovereign for his swindling. I contented myself with taking back exactly what I'd lost. I saw nothing wrong in it and I see nothing wrong in it now. My conscience doesn't trouble me a rap in the matter. Legally, of course, it's quite a different question. Quite, said Sir Clinton, but his tone gave no clue to his views on the matter. As to the actual business, I needn't go over it, for you put your finger on it quite correctly up to a point, not ten minutes ago. I forged his signature, destroyed the cancelled check, cut the counterfoil out of the checkbook, and cashed the forged check. Nobody suspected anything. There was no reason why they should, at the time. No. But now I come to the point where you made a further suggestion. You brought out the idea that I'd murdered Shandon to cover the trail. I suggested it as an hypothesis that some people might be inclined to put forward, corrected Sir Clinton. If you remember, I refrained from supporting it myself. Stenness reflected for a moment. That's true. But murder never entered into my plans at all. Bear in mind that I don't feel a criminal in this affair. All I've done is to take my own money out of the hand of a fellow who had picked my pocket. You'd recover your own purse if you caught a thief red-handed with it, and you wouldn't call yourself a robber for doing so. Well, no more do I. Go on, said Sir Clinton, in unconscious plagiarism. That being so, Stenness continued, murder was the last thing that would have entered my mind. Why should I murder him? I'd squared the account, I'd got my money back again. What would be the point in putting my neck into a noose? None whatever, all I needed was a clean getaway. I planned that carefully enough. That's no particular business of mine at present, Sir Clinton reminded him. But one might ask what you're doing here, since it's evidently not according to plan. It's easy to account for that. I had planned to get away on the evening of the day when the Shandons were murdered. I was in the middle of clearing up preparations for a bolt. And suddenly came the affair in the maze. Could I bolt then? Not likely. I'd have been marked down as the murderer if I'd stirred a step. And look what face would have been on things if I'd cleared out it would have added the last touch of substance to the very hypothesis you put forward. The whole forgery business would have been raked up to furnish a motive. I couldn't have faced it, for I hadn't an alibi. Nobody could swear that I was in my room, I was packing up, at the time the murders were done. It would have been a clear enough case for any jury. Sir Clinton's face showed that he agreed with this reading. There's one point that hasn't come out, though, he said. What's the meaning of this sudden collapse on your part? If your conscience is clear, and I don't doubt your account of it, why do you throw up the sponge like this? That's not very clear. Stenness's face showed that Sir Clinton had touched him on the raw. He had some difficulty with his voice as he replied. I may as well put all the cards on the table. You know what Miss Hawkehurst was like? Any man might have fallen in love with her. I did, at any rate. Were you engaged? No. I've got some sort of pride, even if I am a forger. 
Miss Hawkehurst had an income of her own. What had I? Nothing. Anyone might have supposed I was after her money. Hardly the money alone, surely, Miss Hawkehurst herself would account for the attraction without that. Well, I'm not that sort, said Stenness, abruptly. I'm not the kind of man who can live on his wife's money. I can't explain it. It is so. Your conscience is a rum contrivance, Sir Clinton commented, not unkindly. It's in good working order, at any rate, Stenness retorted. Now, isn't the thing clear enough to you? I meant to recover my money, clear out, work hard and make enough for my purposes. I reckoned that a couple of years would do it, if I took risks. And before I went, I was going to take the biggest risk of all. I was going to tell Sylvia the whole story and see what she had to say. Sir Clinton could not repress his surprise. You're a rum card, Stenness. Be thankful I've had a large experience of liars and know when a man's speaking the truth, for that yarn wouldn't be believed by one person in a hundred. It's the truth for all that, returned Stenness, doggedly. I've told you before that I see nothing wrong in what I've done, nothing morally wrong, I mean. He swindled me. I take my money back again. What's wrong in that? I wish I had your simple way of looking at things. Sir Clinton sat in silence for a few moments, evidently pondering over the case. You're a problem, Stenness, he said at last. I don't really know what to do with you. Oh, arrest me. Stenness exclaimed, bitterly. Nothing matters now. She's dead. It's all over, and I don't much care what happens. Pull yourself together, man, said Sir Clinton, curtly. That sort of chatter does all right on the stage. Nobody with a backbone takes a knock like that. If you wake up three years hence in a prison cell, you'll look at things in a different light, and be very fed up that you've lost your liberty as well as other things. Some things are inevitable. Others aren't. Don't behave like a child. Stenness took the rebuke sullenly. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come. Please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila.